um, yeah, welcome. We do these uh, every two weeks. Uh, the speakers uh, are encouraged to present unfinished work. This was kind of finished. Oh, uh, it's unfinished. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh, to quit at around 40 minutes so that we can get some discussion going. I ask you please to uh, stay more or less in your seats till uh, 1 o'clock or 5 p.m. 1 to 1. So there's no commotion. We will definitely start at 1 uh, and then those who want to stick around and uh, keep to the talking, we'll do that for another 15 minutes or so. So feel free to stick around after. Um, and let me introduce Gabrielle a little more formally. Uh, Gabriel Diaz Monomior is Assistant Professor of Landscape Architecture here. He taught previously at Arizona State. In fact, he's been teaching since 1998. He's a founding partner of you say Labor, Labor. 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 which is Landscape Architecture Board. It's a studio based in Chihuahua City since 2002. Um, his, uh, this office does a broad range of work, different scale, private and public commissions, mostly in the state of Chihuahua. He studied um, architecture at the Institute Superior Institute for Architecture and Design in Chihuahua. He has a professional architecture title from the University of Baltimore, uh, and his master in landscape from Auburn, Alabama. He is a guest lecturer on a long list of universities here, uh, including the GSD. His work has been published in Arkeen Magazine, Journal Sanitico, Outlook Journal, Progressive Planning, and Landscape Architecture, among many others. Uh, Gabriel has been a really um, Instrumental and important member of the landscape faculty, often crossing over into architecture, and I welcome him to his second forum talk. He did one in 2014. And this is a new subject, and I'm very anxious to hear it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thank, thank you very much for the chance to talk about. Uh, this idea that I have been working for some time now, uh, Michael and the Center for American Architecture. Uh, thanks again. Um, what I will uh, show you is a range of projects which uh, encompass uh, a trajectory which uh, started with uh, my first professional projects coming from my um, own uh, practice and which over time uh, have, uh, I think, uh, uh, brought me to a place where I am asking or trying to find if this idea of uh, uh, what to do to actually implement projects is possible. So uh, I'm also, uh, as opposed to probably in the first projects that I'm going to show you, I'm also recently uh, trying to expand uh, this uh, line of inquiry uh, into Latin America uh, for reasons that I will try to explain uh, through my images. So first, first of all, I think it's important to uh, very briefly comment on why hybridization for implementation. Uh, what, what does that mean? This is the definition you would get in Google. Uh, um, the process of an animal or plant breeding with an individual of uh, another species or variety. Uh, and if you do the same for implementation, uh, you are looking at the definition which says the process of putting a decision or plan into effect uh, or execution. So uh, let me just say up front that uh, after this uh, uh, reflection that uh, is actually the nice opportunity, uh, the, provided what did by this nice opportunity to talk, to talk about these things, uh, after reflection on these ideas, uh, I sort of have to say that the hybridization is the sign, right? Uh, in, uh, particularly uh, uh, in the case of uh, the things that I uh, identify as becoming more and more relevant in my uh, uh, personal uh, efforts as a practitioner, as an academic, as a teacher. And also, particularly after looking at other experiences which have been successful or not um, in Mexico and in Latin America. So 
I think it's a, uh, how the idea of hybridization is uh, ultimately uh, about uh, uh, many concepts that uh, have to find a way to become um, a reality. Uh, typologies, morphologies, methods, techniques, disciplines, financing, uh, uh, the administration uh, of projects, um, and of course uh, the specific uh, uh, cultural slash political context that makes uh, projects happen. Uh, maybe I didn't mention a very important thing in the first slide, but I'm looking at public landscape architecture projects, which is uh, of my interest and, and close to my heart. So um, why, why am I looking at this? Well, first of all, let me comment on a number of experiences uh, and things that have been going on since I uh, came into practice and graduated from school. Uh, in the context of Mexico, which is where I based, have based most of my uh, efforts, there is a new context for urban planning, for new institutions, uh, for new concepts in urban planning. This, uh, uh, idea of new institutions is particularly shaped by the uh, creation of a number of local planning institutions, which uh, in the late 1990s, early years of this century, uh, have made an effort to decentralize planning in Mexican cities. Right? Uh, after decades or after pretty much one only trajectory in which uh, decisions regarding planning and development were determined by uh, elected officials, uh, governors, mayors, and whoever uh, these elected officials determined to be in, in the post. Uh, one of the important problems of this uh, culture <laughs> is that, uh, at least in the case of Mexico, the political timing becomes a really uh, complex situation because uh, up until next year, uh, there, there was no re-election of officials. So mayor, mayors have only three years to do stuff. Uh, governors only have six years, uh, presidents six years. Uh, so um, the law has changed in Mexico recently. Now there's going to be a re-election. One period allowed for re-election on uh, lawmakers and uh, mayors. I think that's something very important. But uh, this sort of political culture uh, uh, created the conditions to have the idea of how do we decentralize planning, right? And the uh, product of that is the creation of the planning institutes, which in theory uh, do not depend directly from the mayors or governors. In theory, with, there are different levels of success. Um, I have, uh, as I started practice with, with at uh, the same time as the emergence of this planning institutions, uh, I immediately found uh, and understood this uh, as a very important opportunity, uh, uh, an opportunity in which uh, ideas can be uh, developed uh, uh, without a, a unique link to a, po a political uh, condition, right? And I have been lucky to have the chance to explore uh, collaborations with a number of planning institutes uh, in Mexico, those in green, and also uh, have conversations, meetings, presentations with those in, in, uh, in brown. Uh, as, as you can see, very, very obviously, I think in this map, I, what has been of my interest and continues to be of my interest is not the central part of Mexico, but the peripheries, right? Um, Northern Mexico. And uh, now we are going to start with a studio working in, in Merida, in the uh, Yucatan Peninsula. So, one other important thing that uh, these planning institutions have done is finally uh, they have professionalized planning in Mexico. It's something that didn't really happen that much. They have uh, updated urban plans uh, in most cases uh, with uh, a contemporary uh, mindset, um, like Chihuahua, for example, where there is a you know you have to work with what you have. There are already acquired rights over uh, uh, land uses, uh, land permits, etc. But uh, most of these institutions have been trying to put forward ideas, which in the case of landscape architecture, uh, urban design, are very important. For example, putting together uh, what in many places is sort of like a given idea, uh, a green corridor network, right? 
uh, areas for preservation, uh, for uh, recovery, environmental ecology, uh, ecological <laughs> recovery, like this, uh, as you can see here in this uh, uh, plan. But the problem in most cases is the fact that um, these ideas, um, which are still relatively young, for the most part, have not been implemented, right? In many cases, we're talking already about 15, 15 years of these ideas being out there, but uh, what really prevails is the status quo, right, of investment, at least of public money, right? So another example is Los Cabos, the same situation, a recent plan, a progressive planning, I think, uh, uh, in which uh, there's also this sort of development. In the case of Los Cabos, a much more deliberate attempt to determine uh, natural systems or green corridors as the foundation for an urban structure. Um, we have collaborated with them in the past. I'll show you that project. But you can very clearly see in the maps and drawings and uh, schemes that the urban plan of Los Cabos has, and the, in the written part of it, of course, the uh, effort to put forward um, a new sort of uh, model for uh, urban structure. The Hermosillo is another one, um, and probably not so much development uh, yet in the idea of green corridors, but another very common thing that is going on in Mexico right now is the promotion of active transportation projects or uh, uh, sustainable transportation projects. In this case, this is a bike lane system proposed for Hermosillo, which uh, largely runs on retrofitted streets and along uh, um, drainage ways, which I will explain later today. Um, Mexical is another uh, interesting uh, condition, similar to Hermosillo in the sense that there is a sort of a similar territorial pattern spreading out uh, in a very flat uh, topography, but also uh, containing a, a particularly uh, uh, interesting network of drainage ways and uh, dry washes <laughs> and rivers. Uh, Mexicali, all of these cities have in their plan these ideas for an urban structure, green corridors, uh, recovery of drainage ways, uh, recovery of uh, environmentally re relevant areas like this one here in Mexicali. So, but at the same time, with all of this happening, you know, the, the reality is that as, as I came into practice in the early 20 years of this century, uh, I have a, a, I have to just say it, you know, a, quite, a, quite an experience with unimplemented projects, right? And of course, a frustration, right? Uh, so I'm trying to think what to do, right? Uh, my first uh, project, uh, the, actually the first public project that was hired through my uh, practice was an ecological couriers project for a small city in the state of Chihuahua. And uh, we were based off a transportation project that was done previously. And we were given the task of this idea of ecological corridors. Right? Um, we develop a project, create specs, uh, uh, a catalog, uh, how to do it, uh, what, what's a bench, what's a curve detail, what's a lighting, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but actually, uh, this project, uh, in, if it was implemented, it was implemented like that, you know, just a, a couple of very uh, timid attempts to see if it works, right? Uh, even in a place like this one, which, as we say in Mexico, uh, this is continues to be in many places not a positive thing to say, but this is a small town. You refer to a small town as a bike town, right? For, until recently, this paradigm is changing. That's a nice thing to say. It used to be like, nah, that's a biking town, right? Like, so uh, this project, uh, partially, impl partially implemented, uh, is the first experience. And then I, I'm not going to show you all of those, but uh, another project similar, similar uh, to the previous one, Ecological Corridors for my hometown, Chihuahua, Chihuahua. Uh, today, this project would be called Complete Streets, as the terms evolve, of course. And uh, it's a very interesting example um, when thinking about, you know, how useful are these uh, projects and where do they get to, right? So eventually, in, in, the, in the case of Chihuahua, to this day, out of this structure, and without really following this plan, there are only uh, just a couple of corridors implemented. And uh, uh, they didn't really look at the specifications and the details that we developed in the, in the plan, but I think it's a it's a, a really interesting experience because 
uh, uh, over uh, over 10 years, 13 years, 15 years since the emergence of this concept, the, there was this group of guys who are called the super civic guys, which are, are also the super cynic, the super cynical guys, right? Uh -huh. And they created a, 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 a video, which you can check out in YouTube, for the uh, shortest bike lane in the world, right? <laughs> uh, this is Chihuahua, and uh, this is. This is, uh, the, the, of course, the politician, right? Celebrating now we have a bike lane, people be happy, you know, the, the, the bodyguard in the back, and you know, um, and then the, the people waiting for the bike lane, right? So, you know, we're expecting the bike lane. And then, as it turns out, the, the, the bike lane that's uh, promoted with fanfare, uh, everybody's is uh, thinking about it. People are already complaining about it when it's a very short bike lane, right? Uh, you know, there are, there's no space for cars, blah, blah. You have this guy checking the length of the, of the bike lane uh, with baby steps, right? You know? <laughs> uh, or, or trying to test if it can uh, serve for something else. You know, maybe you can piggyback on the bollards or you know, whatever. There must be a function for this, right? Uh, that's an, uh, the actual photo of the, of the bike lane. It's only 120 meters long, in that, uh, which is you know, 400 feet, right? Uh, so uh, the, another important project in my experience, this is already here in the United States uh, when I was teaching in Arizona. Uh, we developed the design guidelines for the urban edges of Chihuahua, uh, which were meant to contain the uh, sprawling pattern that had been going on in Mexico for the first years of the 21st century. Um, this, this planning institution uh, was concerned about it, but was also interested in what opportunity could emerge from this uh, sprawl. So they, they hired us to develop a set of guidelines which would, in my mind, eventually be uh, over, you know, would be surpassed by development, but they would be left behind as a potential network, right? At least that was my, my thinking. Our thinking in the office, uh, of course, we had to translate that into a more implementable kind of component, which became part of the uh, third update of the urban plan of Chihuahua. There were different uh, edge typologies. Uh, we made uh, simple diagrams to try to explain the concept of decreasing density, different materiality, the integration of green corridors, uh, water management infrastructure. We developed uh, a very, very sort of a simple uh, uh, guidelines for techniques for the uh, manipulation of, of landform, uh, supposed to do it the way it used to happen, which is at the maximum angle of repose when cutting against the slopes. Chihuahua has significant topographic features. Uh, Try to do it in a way that this becomes an opportunity to create uh, 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 segments, stretches of green corridors. Um, in lower income areas, just do simple landform operations to collect water so that the landscape could be extruded over time, become, become a park. Or in cases of these promontories that I was telling you about, find a way to the, the determine edges by regularizing property. Most of these uh, areas are uh, informally developed, right, without legal ownership of the land. So that's an opportunity to define an edge and, and uh, officialize what is, what's already going on, right? Uh, these, these places are occupied by people uh, by making shortcuts uh, within their neighborhoods. But uh, the, what happened with this idea of urban edges was gradually banished from the urban plan of Chihuahua. Right? This is when it was published. Uh, I was uh, preparing for this uh, presentation. I was, wow, man, uh, looking at how it has banished uh, uh, through the updates, right? Uh, the first time the whole section was included and then as it developed, they took away more and more sections. The final section done last year has no mention at all of the idea of urban edges, bordes urbanos, right? Wow. Um, so, uh, of course, it's difficult to get, uh, you know, to implement projects like this in places uh, like Mexico and in, in general Latin America where there isn't uh, yet uh, not, not just a, a political interest on these kind of projects. Uh, in some places there is, of course, uh, but uh, generally speaking, the status quo prevails, right? Uh, urbanization, growth, uh, uh, cars, uh, bridges for cars, etc. cetera. Uh, also, another important thing uh, is that in, in the fact of the matter is that there is a lack of technical 
capacity. Uh, there, is, there aren't enough trained landscape architects, uh, urban designers, planners. I think the impact of trained planners, for example, is very obvious when you look at what the planning institutes are doing now, as I explained. But there isn't enough yet. Um, so uh, how to get here from uh, another photo from my hometown, hometown where to make a green corridor, what, what to do? You just paint the structure of the bridge green. Of course, that's the way to make it green, right? Uh, how to get from here to, to here? Uh, this is the, the very famous uh, uh, green corridor in Seoul, Korea, the Chengyo Cheong corridor that everybody knows about. But in the context of Mexico and Latin America, is uh, permanently I get this question, yeah, but these guys are Koreans, right? <laughs> uh, so how to, how to get there? Uh, another important thing that is important to comment about this reality of the, uh, uh, the local context is uh, projects like this one, right? Uh, uh, this is the Green Track project for Mexico City, the planet's biggest naturalization project, right? This is taken from their website. And the idea is to cover with green walls the structural elements, <laughs> structural elements of the elevated uh, highways of Mexico, right? Mexico City. That's going to have environmental impacts, which are measured. For example, five tons of dust in a million in a city of 20 million people, right? You know, okay, that's great. You know, you're doing a lot. Five tons of dust, right? Um, so, uh, acting in our city, thinking of the planet, right? That's the project. Um, you can go through uh, explanations like this, and uh, you know, I could choose other projects, but this one is particularly interesting to me because another. Another thing that uh, is important uh, to mention about the political context of Mexico City is that, in theory, this is a progressive city, right? We, in Mexico, we look at what Mexico City is doing, right? And the, the political leadership of Mexico is progressive, comes from the left. It has come from the left since it was enabled uh, in the uh, early 90s, right? Because before it was, the government was designated by the Mexican president, right? So. Uh, I think I wonder all the time about, you know, how these projects come to implementation when they are blatantly lying, you know, that's, that, that doesn't happen, right? Come on, you know, this is, this is the reality of this project, right? And what they don't show you, of course, as well here in these kind of projects is the fact that the way to make this happen is uh, because every 10 columns, there's going to be one all covered with uh, advertisements, right, to fund the projects. Um, so how to, how to implement, right? Uh, I have been uh, working on a number of projects which uh, in my uh, logic are trying to fill the void between planning and design. And uh, in a way that uh, this is understood as one of the phases that uh, exists in this trajectory, right? Um, the projects that I'm going to show you have been done here with uh, a number of studios uh, that I have done at the School of Architecture here in Texas. Um, the first one, for example, working with the Planning Institute of Los Cabos, uh, in which we were given the task to work on one of the uh, green corridors proposed in the plan that I already commented. It's called the Arroyo Zacatal. Uh, the problem that the city of Los Cabos has, they have a progressive plan, but they have to uh, work with, of course, all the time with other institutions. In the case of uh, drainage waste like this one, uh, in, in Mexico, the federal government by law uh, is the uh, administrator and the owner of drainage waste of Mexico, right? There's a, there are uh, deep varying widths determined by the uh, um, calculations for the amount of water that has to be able to go through, but uh, this is a responsibility of the federal government, right? So the problem uh, that the city of Los Cabos had is, well, we want to make the idea of the green corridors, but now the federal government is coming in and they just want to do almost uh, the same thing that they have been doing for a long time, uh, uh, narrow the section of the, of the arroyo, and increase the efficiency of the section, right? So we can win uh, land uh, for urbanization. Uh, this is done by a concrete uh, vertical sites. And in, in this case, it was meant to be a, a more progressive idea because the bottom was, was left to be pervious, right? 
but the city was this saying this is not enough, right? So uh, the question was, how do we um, how do we uh, transition from that condition, right, to a condition in which we can leverage the investment to make our ideas possible, the ideas that are put forward in the plan. So uh, what we came up with was this idea to uh, decentralize the water management uh, within the basin, right? So that there would be a capacity to change the section of the of the channel, right? Uh, which is, remains within the efficiency uh, uh, regulations, but at the same time, uh, it's a way to spread the investment and test ideas, which are only in the plan yet, right? Um, this this was done also uh, not uh, looking at the whole basin and trying to think of the uh, project as an assemblage of micro basins, which would eventually have the capacity to be a, a pilot project, which would be more implementable. Right? As it happens, uh, two or three months after presenting this project, delivering the project to the city of Los Cabos, uh, a hurricane came by, ravaged Los Cabos, and the project is still there, right? Uh, it, it, priorities changed, right? And uh, I'm sure that during the uh, hurricane, this thing was really at full capacity, right? Um, so another project uh, in Chihuahua City, uh, there's uh, uh, working with the Planning Institute, we were uh, given the task to uh, look at how to convert this uh, stretch of the river, the Chubisca River, as an integrated river, as an, an urban amenity which still has the capacity to do so because there's, there's still a riparian forest along it and agricultural lands, as opposed to the other stretch of the river, which runs here, which is completely urbanized, right? Sorry, runs here, which is completely urbanized. So the opportunity was also granted by uh, an, an, an infrastructural investment because there was, uh, at the time, it was already under construction, but there was a new bypass being built on this uh, eastern valley of the city of Chihuahua which typically in Mexico and Latin America I have found as well, this re in reality means open a new land for urbanization, right? So uh, that sort of uh, established the conditions for a very interesting diagram in which this infrastructure, if it's already happening, uh, triggers the development of the Eastern Valley of the city. This is the Western Valley, Eastern Valley. And uh, that sort of provided the opportunity uh, in, in, in the logic of the project for the Planning Institute and for, of, and for our uh, studio to articulate a diagram which would make it happen. Right? Um, recovered rivers, integrated rivers are not very common in Mexico and in Latin America, right? are, still, are only happening right now. Um, so the project, uh, this one is still there, you know, it takes time uh, to develop the, uh, the project, but it's still in the, uh, in the uh, projects which are being pushed forward by the planning institutes. Uh, this is the project done by the students, one of the three projects. Uh, the main idea, I think, uh, as, as a design idea was, you know, the, uh, the, the river is already there, the riparian river is already there. And there's another very important thing that uh, at, at least up till then the local authorities uh, overlooked, which is an existing network of uh, rural roads which connect uh, connects agricultural um, settlements all along this uh, stretch of 20 miles or something like that. So um, the project in its spirit was trying to look at the existing uh, water circulation networks for the irrigation of agricultural lands and also look at the existing networks for circulation, people moving from communities to communities and other, uh, the highway, the one that was just built and other uh, more formalized uh, streets which actually make up a quite a quite a, an intense mesh which is not really known by by the city yet right uh, and this is one of the operations that i think are trying to push a little bit forward the ideas which are in the plan at a very large scale right as criteria at least right um, the project um, eventually identified uh, three uh, general sections one of those was the rural section in which the students worked on in the integration of this pre-existing network of paths. And then, you know, there's just some eye candy, of course, very important. This is a, the river as it is uh, today, agricultural lands, uh, the, the riparian forest, and how to make that uh, accessible with simple uh, infrastructural operations, new and uh, retrofitted. 
Um, the, the project made it to the cover of the activities report of the Planning Institute, um, and I think it's still there. Uh, another, another project, um, I will comment more on that <laughs> later. Um, another project was done for the city of Hermosillo uh, with students as well, uh, which was looking at uh, the existing um, uh, uh, man-built artificial drainage ways, which uh, collect water runoff uh, from the city and diverted to the west, right? Following the general uh, slope of this uh, landscape. And we were tasked with, you know, how do we make this uh, uh, an opportunity for uh, the production of public space? Uh, largely because it's already happening, right? There's, 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 this is the, ex the existing condition of, of the, uh, um, I always remember about this, Alan, the ditches. You mentioned ditches, right? <laughs> it's a, uh, but it's actually having an important uh, uh, effect. Uh, people already use it to move through. And also, the uh, concentration of moisture has actually uh, uh, extruded uh, uh, vegetation, trees, uh, in a way that doesn't normally happen in a place like this. It's a, it's a very arid uh, section of the uh, Sonoran Desert, right? Um, when we were there, we were all laughs with the mayor. That's the mayor right over there. This is the planning director and, and the students that went there. Uh, we uh, developed a series of sort of, uh, in a way, uh, guidelines to make these become uh, inhabitable and integrated with other uh, systems, for example, active transportation, public spaces, uh, stabilization of the banks, uh, shade, etc. Another important thing uh, uh, coming from these projects is the, uh, I have found uh, it's actually been there and uh, socializing the project. These projects have different uh, capacities determined by the local political context. Um, sometimes the planning directors want to make it more public, sometimes they do not, but there's always something to learn about, uh, always. Um, this is the presentation of, of the Chubiscar project and, you know, generally speaking, oh, beautiful, all nice, but who has done this before, right? It's always like the question, there is a, a skepticism, right? Uh, coming in this case from the uh, Technical Planning Council of the city of Chihuahua. Um, when, when the planning director presented the project to the uh, construction industry chamber, all nice, but this is not construction. <laughs> this is this is an urban river, right? And these are the guys in Mexico. Typically, the engineers, civil engineers, are more powerful, much more powerful than than architects and designers, right? Um, in the case of the presentation of the Los Cabos project to the same audience, the Technical Planning Council. Um, uh, this was the ecology guy that was all happy. You see, I was telling you, I told you before, but nobody believed me, right? He was very happy, but still. No implementation. Um, in the case of the Hermosillo project, uh, it was very interesting because uh, the planning director made a number of meetings. This is a meeting with local developers who are largely the, the people. Sorry, I'm, I'm blocking you. Uh, largely the people that um, uh, develop the city. And uh, after finishing this meeting, it was very interesting because one of the developers st stood up and told me, "Hey, we are doing that, right? The, the Green Courier." Uh, and I said, "Let's go and check it out." So they took me to to this uh, a section of one of the drainage ways, which they integrated into a subdivision, which was, I think, actually nice, you know, uh, uh, um, nicely done. But the problem is that it's just a stretch of 150 meters or something like that, right? So I, I, I wonder, uh, is this the shortest green corridor in the world, right? Uh, you know, this is the, the problem. All of the projects that I'm showing you before, both from my practice and done in studio, of course, are large scale, uh, very expensive, very complicated projects, right? So I started to ask the question, uh, how to make it happen, right? And, and in Latin America, because, you know, I cannot, I cannot continue to show the Seoul project to a planning council, right? They, they love to see it, but then they say, oh, but that's Korea, you know? So, you know. so I went, uh, I had the chance to, to do a research trip uh, last summer to uh, two countries in Latin America, well, actually three, but, only two countries included in the uh, in the um, in this grant uh, given by the Lozano Long Institute for Latin American Studies, um, and I was particularly interested in this scale of landscape architecture with an urban structure capacity. I I, I went to uh, Santiago in Chile and to Medellin and Bogota in, in in Colombia, 
and interview the planners and practitioners who have been designing and, and proposing these uh, planning ideas. It was very, very illustrative. Uh, we were together, Juan, you and I, in, Col in Colombia. Thank you, Juan, again. <laughs> and uh, uh, what to look at in South America. The, this is the first, well, without, uh, this is not chronologically uh, following the, the sort of the, the route taken in the trip, but uh, the first thing that I, that I would like to comment on these successful experiences is, of course, Medellin, once again, in, in, Col in Colombia. Uh, this is taken from one of the brochures given to you in the hotel, right? And I find it very, very interesting, you know, the, the, the structural capacity of the river in Medellin, right? That's very obvious, even here, right? That's important. Uh, this is a sketch from the uh, 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 Plan de Ordenamiento Territorial uh, de Medellin, which is the urban plan. Uh, the, the ones that I was showing you from Mexico are pretty much the same thing, the uh, uh, regulating plan for the city. And uh, this is a sketch uh, taken from one of the uh, promotional documents in which we can clearly see the uh, structural role uh, not granted, but accepted from the river in Medellin, right? And uh, this, this uh, structure uh, exists right now in Medellin at the planning level, but also they have been able to successfully implement the first uh, pilot project for, for the uh, Rio Medellin. Uh, I had the chance to interview Jorge Perez Jaramillo, who I'm pretty sure is the uh, author of this sketch uh, as well, right? And uh, who was the, the planning director in Medellin uh, at the time, and actually working in the, as a consultant in the, in the urban plan. And I also had the chance to interview with, with Juan Jun that we were together interviewing this a very, very young team of practitioners who were selected through the means of an open design competition to uh, the, the design the, the, this, uh, the physical design of this uh, uh, project for the river. Right? Um, this is a thing that I would like to, a particular condition that I would like to just uh, point out in the differences between Colombia and Mexico, for example. Uh, in Colombia has, is, a, I think, a world renowned example of um, uh, opening uh, public design to competitions in a very successful way. They have been able to develop not just uh, the good ideas, the best projects, but also helped develop uh, the young generation of designers that are doing this kind of stuff right now. This Sebastian Monsalve and Juan David Hoyos and their team are in their late 20s, early 20s. You know, they're very young people who, who competed against uh, pretty much very well-established firms worldwide, right? And they won. Um, and another important thing to say about Colombia is that it seems that they have been able to create a system of design competitions, which is actually honest, right? Uh, <laughs> because there are sometimes you're sort of like a, the fake competition, right? Uh, that's oftentimes, unfortunately. So uh, generally speaking, given that the uh, uh, river in Medellin is already channelized, uh, they have been uh, proposing a, an idea, which is just uh, capping the freeway along the, along the river and making parks on top of the freeway, right? As you can see here in this section, the river, the highways, the, the freeways, and then a park on top. Um, we were there, as I mentioned, this is the way it looks right now, the, the, the channel of the river, the first park. Uh, when we were there, it was just about to be finished. And uh, it looks better now, just a few months later. You can see there's a relationship, a relationship which was lost, right, for a long time. Um, this is a stretch, uh, which is a pilot project. They are hoping that this is going to unfold to the other side uh, very soon. And then the, the strategy is not to do it all along the river, but just identify strategic locations to cap the freeway and integrate uh, uh, the city with this river, right? Not the whole thing. That would be too much, not viable uh, with the existing budgets. The project won uh, the first prize in the second uh, Biennale of La Latin American Landscape Architecture where I had the chance to be a juror as well um, and look at what's going on in Latin America just after my trip to, to, Bogot, uh, to Colombia and Chile. Uh, but in reality, the, I think that w the project that struck me the most is this one. Um, the, uh, uh, what's going on right now in uh, uh, the Mapocho River in, in Santiago. The project is called Mapocho 42K, uh, and it's pretty much, it's named as a, bike promenade 
also described as a geographic promenade by the authors. And uh, what they are doing here is that they are uh, building 42 kilometers, 26 miles long of uh, what they have called Ciclo Parque, which means Pike Park, um, which has a particular political complexity that it runs through 11 different municipalities. Right? Uh, it, as I understood from my interviews with uh, my colleagues in Chile, um, you one might wonder what the hell is going on in Santiago de Chile? Why do they have 11 municipalities, right? Uh, as opposed to just one city government, right? And of course, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, uh, formula here is that in a country like Chile, uh, having only uh, one mayor uh, in command of the largest city of the, of the country would be too powerful, too close to powerful to the Chilean president, right? So what's the political strategy? Divided into 11 or, or more cities, right? So that there is a clear difference in political uh, power. But that's even more interesting, right? Uh, when thinking about how to implement projects in, in, in this complicated political culture. Uh, I had the chance to uh, bike uh, uh, what was existing then during the summer, uh, the project with the uh, uh, person that has been behind it uh, for the longest time, who's Sandra Iturriaga, um, who's a professor at the Universidad Católica de Chile. So that's another important thing, you know, coming from these experiences in studio projects. Um, I, I was amazed at how they made it happen, how they are making it happen, right? They, they started with Applied Studios for three years, right? Uh, repeat and make it better. They, uh, they, they got to a point in which they made a proposal and got the funding from uh, the federal government, uh, the Housing and Urbanism Secretary of Chile. They have continued to administer the project funds, the school, right? It's administering this project. Um, they created a foundation to shield it from other threats, right? Uh, also, the university is acting as a, a sort of a shield, right? Because one thing is to go against a practitioner and a firm, another one is to go uh, against a renowned institution, uh, educational institution. Uh, and then the most important thing, I think, uh, as well for the implementation is they found a way to implement the project uh, in, a, in a feasible proposal by coming with an unknown concept. You know, if, if they name this project bike route, they are there. Because all of the 11 uh, cities have different specifications for what a bike route has to be, right? But what they did is that this is not a bike route, this is not a park, this is a cyclo park, right? Therefore, they escape from regulations, right? Everything is new, and uh, the specifications are as specific, so that they cannot move anything. You know, these, these local governments, they just have to go with it. Uh, of course, there is a lot of convincing to be done. Uh, and it's going on right now. Uh, they have been working for six years after the three years of uh, applied studios, but uh, so far they have been able to implement half of the of the of the project, um, which is connecting parks along the way, which are already existing, which is integrated to new uh, uh, freeway projects uh, like this one here, which was under construction when we were there. Uh, it goes uh, uh, the side of the river, uh, connecting upper income neighborhoods with low income neighborhoods as well. Um, it goes through historical remains of the previous infrastructural works of the city and through other uh, more contemporary uh, new parks. This, this, this guy here is 12 years old and he biked with us 20 kilometers. I was, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, half of the project is done right now. So the inquiry is, uh, after looking at this project, how to shift the scope from the territorial to a more targeted tactical approach. Uh, I have been thinking about shifting scale, right? Um, uh, I have been working on two stages. One is Mexicali and Hermosillo. I'll go rapidly through this because it's very synthetical. Yes, yeah. Uh, Me Mexicali also has a bike uh, uh, route plan. And they also have a, an initiative to do something with the uh, drainage ways of the city, uh, in this case being presented by the ecologist when I was there uh, with them. Um, I have been exploring, you know, if they are looking at uh, mobility plans, but they are also looking at the integration of the green corridors. Well, I think that the problem is that the projects, thinking about it, are pretty much 
this is the bike plan, this is the, uh, the, the Green Corridor project, right? There, there has to be a way to, to integrate both, to make them more uh, feasible, implementable, right? So, it, oh, and not all of the drainage works, are, drainage works are the same. Some are within the city, some are in the extensive agricultural valley. So, uh, try to think about the project in, in, in a more characterized way. Uh, retrofit streets in the urban core as planned, but also use the existing canal network in the periphery to structure future infill, not as planned. That's the problem. In Hermosillo, uh, same thing, uh, the, an extensive uh, bike route plan isolated from the opportunity of green corridors uh, makes me think about, well, what happens if we put them both together again, right? And identify a more targeted approach in which uh, uh, the project becomes feasible, first of all, because it's smaller, right? But it also has the capacity to be much more tactical and precise on what's being connected as opposed to trying to spread out a whole new system over a city which does not have a culture to invest in this kind of projects, right? This is just happening, this is just emerging, right? So I also think that the small scale is important. Uh, I think baby steps are important, right? Like this guy, right? And I was thinking, when I saw that video, I was like, shit, that's my project. Well, at least part of that's my project. But, uh, but baby steps are important as well, right? And I think that uh, the cities like Hermosillo, for example, after what, what they have come up with the plan, what we did in the studio, and other chances that they have uh, been looking for, uh, which happily they have continued to invite me to a couple of events, like for example, this event uh, developing the site guidelines for the, green, for the green infrastructure in Hermosillo, or more recently, uh, uh, the participation of Hermosillo and, and Hermosillo's projects in this forum, which was organized by the Border Environment Cooperation Commission of Orcent Uncertain Future today. Uh, uh, but uh, all together, you know, baby steps that Hermosillo has been able to do, they have been uh, working on green infrastructure projects. Luckily for them, because they are also very close to, to Arizona, and Arizona has been very successful on developing this kind of green infrastructure projects in a do-it-yourself approach, right? So they are following, and uh, hopefully at some point they will get to a more structural capacity, which was presented by the planning director, and that's a student project presented in the same forum in uh, September 2016. Right? That's my line of inquiry today. I'll take questions. Thank you. Right, so, so how does this relate to the social fabric of these cities, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I can understand, you know, that there are opportunities for creating this infrastructure. Yeah. But then relating this infrastructure to the social fabric of the city, or maybe even the economic fabric of the city, is yeah. there any, uh, it seems to me that you'd have a lot more people on your side mm -hmm. if, if those fabrics were integrated into, that, <coughs> into this kind of green infrastructure that you're working on. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, think there's a, a, a site-specific site um, um, condition. Um, uh, for, for example, example, in the case of Hermosillo, the uh, planning, planning director has been able to actually convince not just one mayor, but two mayors, both of them coming from different political parties, which is quite an achievement. And another important achievement in, in her case is that she survived the, the political transition, so she's going well. And she has been able to, you know, these, these, these small projects are, everybody can see them, and they work with local communities, uh, the schools that go along these small green infrastructure projects to make it happen. Uh, they have been publicizing all of the uh, jets, a small efforts, but they are publicizing that in uh, newspapers, etc. And the mayor is talking about it, etc. Uh, but that's El Mosillo. And by the way, our project, the one done in studio, we did uh, map the socioeconomic conditions to determine uh, where to act first and where to act later, right? or how to do it. Right? But, uh, for, for example, example, in Chihuahua, Chihuahua the, the project is much more contained in professional and administrative audiences because 
uh, it runs along uh, agricultural lands. And uh, this is uh, potentially a political uh, um, complexity uh, because uh, often these uh, uh, farmers are um, organized uh, by political opposition to you know, just pretty much stop projects. Right? And, uh, also, uh, another very important condition of Chihuahua is that the land tenure is uh, not private, but it's uh, an ejido tenure. So it's sort of like a co-op uh, tenure, uh, uh, public-private. Uh, so that's uh, that condition of Chihuahua. And Los Cabos, um, I think uh, the project it has not been yet socialized uh, because uh, uh, of where is the economic cap, uh, power? Right? In the case of Hermosillo, uh, I presented, as I commented, to local developers right? and to try to show ideas and to get them on board. Right? Uh, in the case of Los Cabos, I didn't present the project to developers. I presented the project to uh, the representatives of the tourism industry right? who uh, have, have a very, very different, different attitude, attitude right? they just want to protect, protect uh, you know, uh, the, the way, way they have been successfully profiting from this resort location. location. So, so long story short, short, I think uh, one, one of the uh, conditions, conditions that is very interesting in this uh, research is uh, this, this diversity of uh, political and social circumstances that you have to address, right? Um, on each project. So one of the reasons I bring it up is you showed me the which you know used to be a really bad place, right? yeah. and it's undergoing a major transformation. Yeah. And yeah. I was wondering what you had observed about that. Well, uh, uh, Jorge Perez Caramillo, when I interviewed him, he the first thing he explained uh, why Medellin has been able to do that. He told me, you know, Medellin came, emerged, reemerged from a very traumatic period. Uh, uh, very uh, uh, sad period of time with uh, uh, violence, uh, crime, ravaging the population, right? And uh, in, in his point of view as a planner, he commented on how that enabled them to organize and agree as a society, as a society, as a society right? And be able to uh, have success on the uh, implementation of a number of projects, right? And agree on uh, also the sort of the ideas behind the projects, right? Which they continue to implement uh, today, you know, uh, very socially oriented projects, right? Well, there's a lot of civic architecture that's also built. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you talk about or mentioned the Mexico City example where they are a Raising those columns with vegetation and every other column, or at least all, mm -hmm. they have advertising that they go to. So that made me think about yeah, it's, 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 an, it's an interesting model, might be perhaps uh, difficult to understand. But what are the, I think it seems that the economic models that actually will help to promote this type of infrastructure. See, I don't know if there is any, any uh, incentive for the city. To invest on that and also partner with, with, the, with the private or the, you know, companies or, or, or institutions mm. in order to help to, to make it happen. I mean, what can incentivize this economically? Right? How, what can mm. actually make this attractive here for developers or for the city itself to, act, to, 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 make, to implement it so there is some type of revenue or some type of gain from that? It seems that. It's, might be a, a, a potential yeah. model or, yeah. or solution to. I, I, well, that, that project of the of the Via Verde is actually, actually a private investment, investment right? right? Uh, and uh, uh, in theory, you know, uh, what I have researched about it is that it's just a private investment, and it makes sense uh, because they have this profit from the advertising, right? Uh, I, I mean, I think uh, in the end uh, that that that's. that's that's nice, nice, right? right? That's, That's cool, cool right? right? Uh, and, and I think, think it should be leveraged if there are opportunities like that. The problem, I think, uh, exists when you publicize a project like that to the city, right? And uh, you're telling lies, you know? That project is not doing that, right? 
And if, you, if that's the kind of project that uh, you are using to say that there is a collaboration between private and public uh, you know, uh, entities, to make something environmental happen, you know, then, then we are doomed, right? Uh, 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 I, think I think that's, I think that the problem in that case uh, is the way how the city uh, communicates whatever the city has agreed with uh, these particular investors, right? I, I would say, you know, uh, the city can, can much more effectively invest with uh, mo much cheaper projects, probably coming from their own budget, but with much cheaper projects and much more effective projects as well, environmentally and socially. So, but I think it's also a very important condition because, as you know, in Mexico and in, in Latin America in general, there isn't that much of a tradition to, to uh, uh, develop these kind of projects uh, in a public partnership uh, uh, approach, a public-private approach. Uh, when I, uh, I, I went back to Chihuahua for the holiday and I met uh, with the planning director, who's also a friend of mine, and he, he continues to comment on these opportunities. Public-private is the way to approach it. Yeah, but, you know, you, you can convince the public, but the problem is to convince the private guys, right? Uh, 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 at least in the, in the in the culture of that particular place, uh, Chihuahua, right? Which I think is generally speaking as, uh, uh, an example of what happens almost elsewhere in Mexico, right? So I think it's an important topic because these projects, as the one going on in Chile or the one going on in Medellin, is public money, right? right? Public money. Uh, I remember when I invited uh, the... Um, uh, our common friend uh, who worked with Felipe Leal in the Daniel, uh, when he was presenting all of the projects they did in Mexico City with the previous mayor, right? And you look at these projects and, and, and it, it surprised people that all of this is public money. Right? So I think it's a, a problem, right? Uh, it's, it's an opportunity, opportunity. It's, a, it's a problem, but at the same time, you know, in many ways it makes sense as well. I'm going to close and ask any students that have questions to stick around for the after, after session. Thank you very much.